Hello everybody. The Biochemical Society, the British Society for Research on Aging and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, part of the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. Topics in the series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Please see the website for more details. So my name's Claire Stewart. I'm a professor of stem cell biology at Liverpool John Moores University with a fundamental research interest in the regulators of muscle adaptation with aging. It is an honor and a pleasure in my role as chair to represent the British Society for Research on Aging as a co-host of this meeting today. Before continuing, I would also like to extend a particular thanks to Ellie Davis of the Biochemical Society for all of her help and support in enabling this Joint Society webinar, and to you as the audience for joining us today. Today's webinar is called Genes Regulating Aging and the Quest for Immortality. We know that aging has a profound impact on human society and modern medicine, and although hundreds of genes are known to regulate aging in model organisms, its causes remain largely unknown and warrant further investigation. Today, we welcome Professor Schwal Pedro de Magalhães from the University of Liverpool's Integrative Genomics of Aging Group, who will talk about the genes regulating aging and benefits of <clears throat> applying this knowledge to human health. Professor de Magalhães obtained a degree in microbiology in 1999 and a PhD in the mechanisms of aging in 2004. Following a postdoc at Harvard Medical School with genomics pioneer Professor George Church, in 2008 he was recruited to the University of Liverpool where he leads the Integrative Genomics of Aging group. His lab studies the aging process and how we can manipulate it to fend off age-related diseases, and improve human health. He has authored over 100 publications and given over 100 invited talks, including three TEDx talks. Furthermore, he has a long-term interest in technological trends and their future impact on society. So questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, but you can send in your questions during the talk. If you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image of the screen. So with no further ado, it is now my pleasure to hand you over to Professor de Magalhães. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you to the, the Biochemistry Society and the BCRA for this uh, opportunity and invitation to, uh, to talk a bit about uh, the process of aging um, and the, the latest breakthroughs in this field. So, um, I'm sharing my slides now. I hope everybody's seen that. Otherwise, please let me know. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, as Claire was mentioning, aging is a it's a major uh, and very timely process to study. Um, but of course, that's not uh, that's not new. Um, since the the beginning of time, that uh, you know, a number of people, particularly men, have tried to fend off aging and discover the the cure for aging and the secret to immortality. I think probably the, the earliest was uh, Qingqing Wang, who was a, a Chinese emperor who uh, built the, the terracotta army, so a very powerful man. And he tried, uh, instructed the court physicians of the time to develop uh, a cure for, for uh, a way to live forever. Uh, unfortunately for him, um, they, what they developed was uh, mostly made of mercury. Um, and so sadly and, and ironic, he actually died of mercury poisoning. But there's been a number of other, uh, again, typically men trying to search the cure for aging and to search the fountain of the youth. Um, and what I hope to, to convince you today is that, you know, there has been a lot of advances in our understanding of aging. There has been a lot of breakthroughs. Um, and uh, at least there is a prospect of retarding and delaying the process of human aging, which would have huge medical benefits. Uh, so I'll start with a, uh, an introduction to what we know and what we don't know about aging. Um, so let me start by defining the process of aging. I, I guess one of the advantages of working on aging is that um, everybody's familiar with this process. Um, and it is quite striking, as you can see in these uh, Czech centenarians. 
Uh, now, of course, aging entails a variety of changes, molecular, cellular, physiological changes, and various degenerative processes. So I like the definition of aging, which is a fairly broad definition as a progressive deterioration of physiological function, accompanied by an increase in vulnerability and mortality with age. Um, so that's very broad, and of course, aging, again, entails various changes, um, but in a sense, it, uh, it consists of physiological decline, degeneration, increase in vulnerability, and then we see an increase in mortality with age. So, for example, in the human species, once you reach about age 30, your chance of dying double roughly every eight years. And that's very consistent across populations. Um, so, of course, the reason we're doing this webinar, as I'm sure you're aware, is uh, because we are on a pandemic uh, because of COVID-19. And so things changed back in, in February, March of this year, and we went on lockdown. I mean, I think in the last six months, I've been in my office once at university. So, so things change a lot. I would say the human civilization change uh, because of COVID-19, but I would argue also because of aging. So this is data from China, um, but it's very similar in other countries as well, considering the mortality of COVID-19 by age. And as you can clearly see, and I'm sure you're aware, the mortality is much, much higher to older individuals. Children tend to be largely unaffected or to have relatively mild symptoms. Only it's about age 50 does mortality start to increase. So clearly COVID-19 is a disease uh, of the elderly, is a disease associated with aging, and it's a disease that if there were no process of aging, would probably go unnoticed. So, of course, aging has, a number of other diseases like cancer, neurodegenerative disease, etc. But I really think that COVID-19 is, is really exemplifies really the, the problematic of having an aging population um, because you have diseases like certain infectious diseases that affect much more elderly individuals than younger ones. However, okay, so we want to do something about it. When you think about how, there's a couple of problems. The, the major problem is we don't really know why we age. We don't know exactly why this happens, why this increase in, uh, in mortality with age, an increase in, in this case, mortality from COVID-19 occurs with age. We say, all right, the immune system gets worse with age, but we don't know at the molecular and cellular uh, level why that happens. Uh, and broadly speaking, that's true for, for other systems of the body, and that's true for the aging process as a whole itself. We still do not understand the molecular mechanisms driving the process of aging. We know of hypotheses. Um, I'll mention a couple of them. Um, you know, the idea that DNA damage is important in aging, for example. Uh, but we don't know for sure why human beings age or why the immune system ages. Having said that, uh, there has been breakthroughs, which I'll go through, and there has been developments that suggest that it is possible to intervene in the process of aging. So. I'll tell you about two areas. So the first one is about uh, looking at other species and the fact that there are species of animals that appear not to age, what Tug Fitch coined negligible senescence. And as you can see in these examples, these are complex vertebrates. These are not little amoebas or unicellular organisms. These are complex animals, like some species of fishes, like this is a, a rockfish uh, of the genus Sebastus. Um, there's certain types of turtles, like painted turtles and Galapagos tortoise. Uh, this is the Olm, which is a kind of um, blind salamander that lives in caves. Uh, and these animals, they appear not to age. What, what it means is that when you study them, in some cases for decades, there is no increase in mortality, contrary to what you see in humans and, for example, mice. Um, there's no observable physiological decline, and there's an increased reproductive output with age, at least in some species. So, for example, in some fishes that they grow throughout their lives, uh, all the animals or all the females are going to lay more eggs. And, I mean, that has evolutionary implications as well that I won't discuss here, but you, know, you can then argue that if you have a higher reproductive output in older age, and it makes sense for those animals not to age. Um, but the point is that these species appear not to age. I mean, of course, the, the question I always get, all right, so how do we know they don't age after 50 or 500 years? Of course, we don't know that for a fact. I mean, it's hard enough to get grants for three-year projects. Um, but the point is, at the very least, these animals, they age much, much, much slower than human beings. 
to the point that it is imperceptible to us if they age at all. So aging is neither inevitable nor universal. All human beings age if we live long enough, but there are species at very least that age much, much slower than us. So there's no rule, no, uh, uh, no unsurmountable biological barrier that says um, aging is inevitable. Um, and we can use that as inspiration, you know, just like the Wright brothers used birds as inspiration to develop airplanes. Now, the other aspect that uh, we can look at it, be optimistic about uh, aging is because we now know that in animal models, aging is surprisingly plastic. So, so this is really one of the great, I would say, conceptual um, breakthroughs of the field. And I, I really think this uh, should receive the Nobel Prize um, for these advances in, in particular at the genetic level. So age one was the first single gene identified that could have a significant impact on lifespan at the time in C. elegans, in the roundworm C. elegans. And that was discovered by Tom Johnson and colleagues in 1988. They didn't actually know the function of it, that's why we called it age one. Uh, but now we know that aging could be manipulated by a number of genes uh, and by interventions as well, like dietary interventions that I'll, I'll, I'll come back in a little bit. And this is huge because it means we can tweak a single gene and we can significantly increase the lifespan of animals. Uh, and if we could do that to humans, that, that would give us an avenue for developing therapies or at least interventions for retarding human aging, which is remarkable. So, I mean, I've always found this fascinating. And in fact, back when I was a, a PhD student, I started this collection of databases called uh, the Human Aging Genomic Resources, um, which have grown since then. And, and now they have hundreds of thousands of visitors, hundreds of citations. Um, and one of these databases is the Genage database of aging-related genes, which really reflects the, the advances and breakthroughs that we have seen in uh, recent years. So, the latest version of our database, of our Genage uh, database of age-related genes, as you can see, we have now over 2,000 genes in model systems that, when manipulated, that is like knockout, overexpression, silencing, uh, results in a significant impact on aging or longevity. And if you look at worms, for instance, there's nearly 900 genes in worms that impact on longevity including a, an increase in lifespan by tenfold. There is a single gene, interestingly, it's an age one allele, um, though not the one initially discovered in 1988, there's a, an allele that increases the lifespan of worms by 10 times. So instead of these animals living a, a few weeks, now they're living over six months. And even in mice, you can have single gene manipulations that increase lifespan by nearly 50%. Uh, and you also have genes in mice that if you disrupt them, accelerate aging. So I'll show you uh, one example. I think these are a particular gene called ERCC1. So this is involved in DNA damage responses and, um, and DNA repair. Um, and so it's excision repair um, gene. So when you disrupt it in mice, when you mutate it, you have these animals here on the right. So these two animals have the same age, but on the left you have a wild type control, and on the right you have the mutant animals. And as you can see, they look older, and they also have a shorter lifespan than the controls. So they appear to be aging faster. And conversely, you can have single gene manipulations in, uh, in mice um, that significantly increase lifespan. So again, these are two animals of the same age. Um, the small one, it's not a pup, it's not a young animal, it's actually a... Uh, uh, an animal that has a mutation in growth hormone signaling. Uh, so these animals, as well as the name implies, growth hormone makes animals and, and humans grow. So if you have a mutation that disrupts growth hormone signaling, like growth hormone receptor, uh, you tend to have these this little, well, quite cute actually, animals, um, but that also live quite a long time. So they live up to 50% longer and they're protected from age-related diseases. So they're protected from cancer, for example. So the point is that you can have single gene manipulations to accelerate aging, including in mammals, and you can have single gene manipulations that retard aging, and not just make animals live longer, but they live longer healthier, which is what we want. We don't want to just live longer, we want to preserve health and postpone age-related diseases. So, okay, so that's, that's very impressive, that's brilliant. As I said, you should get a Nobel Prize for these advances in the genetics of aging, um, but what about humans? 
So I'll show you two examples from what we know. Of course, we cannot do genetic manipulations in humans uh, as we can in, in model systems, but there is a lot of evidence that genetics also plays a role and that it is possible to manipulate to some degree the process of aging in humans. So this is, I'll show you two examples. The first example, this is a study, I think it was done in Ecuador by uh, Walter Longo and uh, Dr. Jaime Guevara Guerre, which you see here. So, and this is a, a studied group. And as you can see, these are small people. So the idea was very simple is that, okay, so if you knock out the growth hormone signaling, specifically growth hormone receptor in mice, you have long-lived animals. So there are people who have mutations in this gene who are small, so maybe they live longer or age slower as well. Um, so that's what they've done. They studied these families in, um, in Central America that have this mutation in, in growth hormone receptor. What they found, or the most interesting result, uh, was this, was that growth hormone receptor deficient individuals, they don't die of cancer, um, which is what you see compared to the relatives that don't have the same mutation. Um, I mean, the sample size is not very large, uh, 15 individuals, um, but still that is very impressive given that in most populations you'd expect about 20-25% of individuals to die of cancer. Uh, and that's that's what you'd expect in a UK population. Um, now, the obvious question is, okay, so they're protected from cancer, but do they live longer? The answer is no. These individuals do not live longer. They seem to have a high incidence of some other diseases, cardiovascular diseases, for example. Um, the way it was explained to me uh, by Walter Longo, actually, is that they have smaller arteries, and because this, uh, small people have smaller arteries, they clog up faster and so they develop more cardiovascular diseases. So it's not exactly the same as you see in mice. Uh, on the other hand, it's I think it's very interesting and very exciting that just changing a single gene or observing mutations in a single gene can have such a strong protection against cancer, which is a, of course an age-related disease. Now the other example comes from uh, genetics of human longevity. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, longevity runs in families. Uh, and this is actually the, the oldest human being on record, Jean Calman, she lived to be 122. Um, and she also ate lots of uh, chocolate and she was very fond of port wine from my hometown of Porto in Portugal. So she didn't really have the healthiest of lifestyles and still she managed to live quite a, a, a long time. I mean, she once joked to journalists that the secret for her to turn 120 is that she stops smoking when she, she turned 110. Uh, which is actually true. She did smoke for most of her, her adult life. Um, so there has to be some genetic basis to it, some genetics basis to longevity. Um, unfortunately, we don't know uh, that basis yet. I mean, there's been a number of studies in centenarians and they failed to find lifestyle factors in Kamen. However, it does appear to run in the family. In other words, um, the best way for you to live a long life is to choose your parents and grandparents well because that um, increases dramatically your chances of also becoming a centenarian. Um, so, so there is clearly a heritable component to it. Uh, we can actually quantify this, the, for example, in twins. Um, and longevity is moderately heritable. That is, has a moderate genetic component, um, about 25% but it increases with age. So, so what it means is, so for example, body size, uh, sorry, height, um, it's more heritable. I think it's about 50%. Um, so it's more, has a stronger genetic component, uh, but longevity increases with age. So what that means is that if you want to be a healthy 70 or 80 year old, you better follow a good lifestyle. You better follow your doctor's and mother's advice and you know, don't smoke, eat healthy and so on. But if you want to, live to be a centenarian, if you want to live over 100 years, again, as I mentioned, you have to choose your parents well. Now, the big challenge, of course, is now to figure out which, which genes are determining this, and that's what we still don't know. So we know a lot from model systems, but we don't know all that much about human longevity. So, so I guess the, the point is that clearly there's a genetic component to, um, to longevity. Um, and even though the genome is very big, 3 billion base pairs, um, with 20,000, well, protein coding genes and God knows how many non-coding genes, uh, very subtle changes in the genome can have a very strong impact on aging. And we see that in animal models, for which we know a lot regarding genetics of aging, um, and we see that in, uh, in human beings as well, even though we don't 
understand well which specific genes are involved in, in human longevity yet. So I guess um, my lab, we, I'm, I'm fascinated by this impact, and, uh, but ultimately I also want to understand aging to intervene on it. So our lab, we do a, a variety uh, of approaches. We combine experimental and computational matters from computational systems biology approaches, machine learning. I'll mention a couple of examples. Um, dietary manipulations, cell models and senescence, and, and also evolutionary analysis, including looking at long-lived species. So, I mean, what I'll do is I'll, I'll mention a, um, a few projects we've been involved in recent years. Uh, without going into a lot of detail, most of what I'll mention, not all, but most has been published. So you can uh, look more details in the papers or happy to, to take questions afterwards. And feel free to email me as well. So for, for here for today, I'll just give a broad overview of some of the different projects we've been involved in. Um, so I guess one of the aspects that, um, in terms of aging that I've been interested for some time is the relationship between aging and age-related diseases. Okay, so how much are, so the model systems suggest that aging is not just age-related diseases running in parallel. It suggests that there are intrinsic processes and changes that predispose us to a lot of age-related diseases. Um, Alzheimer's, cancer, um, COVID-19. So we've looked at this uh, in the context of cancer in particular. So, I mean, I did this review for Nature a few years ago. Uh, what I argued essentially that aging changes, so changes that occur in our bodies with age can be detrimental to cancer, but it can be beneficial to cancer. So, for example, you can have increase in inflammation with age, which is thought to be beneficial to cancer. It makes cancer grow. On the other hand, you can have vascular changes and hormonal changes um, that seems to be detrimental to cancer. Uh, but that's going to vary a lot also between tissues. So exactly which how aging process impact on cancer will vary across tissues. Um, and we don't, we cannot quantify that yet. So one project we did last year was look at the transcriptome, look at the gene expression changes between aging uh, and cancer. We also looked at senescence, but I'll, I'll come back to it in, in a couple of minutes. So basically, we, what we did was we took data from publicly available data, data sets like GTX and uh, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and we derived genes that are differentially expressed. So we derived uh, tissue-specific gene expression changes in aging, so genes going up and down during aging, and we derive uh, genes that go up and down during cancer. And then we compare those. So, I mean, we published this, was done by, by Cassett, a PhD student in my lab, uh, and a few others. Um, so what we found, and I'll, again, I'll just summarize what we found, was that um, although there is, in general, an increase in cancer with age, although there are a couple of tissues that actually are exceptions for that, um, when you compare the gene expression patterns between cancer and aging, in general, you see opposite changes in, in changes. So in other words, if during aging there's an increase in gene expression or, or particular genes increase during aging, they tend to decrease in cancer and vice versa. And these tend to be genes mostly related to cell cycle, which makes sense. You, you'd expect cell cycle to increase during cancer and to decrease during aging. Um, also because of accumulation of senescent cells, which I'll, I'll non-dividing cells, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Uh, and also genes related to the immune system. Again, a system that we know changes with aging and changes with cancer. However, there were exceptions. Uh, one of them was the thyroid, uh, and the other very strongly was the uterus. So for example, in the uterus, we see the complete opposite. So, so genes that change during aging, that increase during aging, also increase during cancer of the uterus. And genes that decrease uh, with aging in the uterus are also downregulated in uterine cancer. So I found that was quite interesting. Now, my initial interpretation was okay, maybe these changes during aging are detrimental to cancer. In other words, during aging, you see changes in tissues that are opposite of those of cancer, um, and this kind of prevent even cancer development. Um, cancer, of course, still develops because of mutations. That was my initial interpretation, actually. Um, but others, like uh, James D. Gregory, who was actually a reviewer for our paper, he pointed her out, maybe that's not, maybe it's the other way of seeing it is that you see changes during aging, 
for example, a decrease in cell cycle, decrease in cell proliferation, and that actually creates a better or a more prone or a more fertile tissue environment for cancer development. Um, so, I mean, at the moment, I'm agnostic about the interpretation. I think there's different interpretation to the results. And if anyone has any suggestions, please let me know. Now, as I already briefly mentioned, the other angle um, in the relationships between cancer and aging is cell senescence. So, senescent cells, my definition are that these are cells that should be dividing, but are not. So this was initially discovered in vitro uh, by Leonard Hayflick and, and, and Paul Moorhead. Essentially, if you take some cells from your skin, they only divide a certain amount of times in vitro. Um, so, so now we know that with time, um, senescent cells accumulate in tissues. Um, so that's been observed in, in some human tissues. There's a lot of work in mice showing this to be the case. I mean, we, we did this uh, review two years ago um, that, that uh, um, compiles this information. So the hypothesis is that senescent cells accumulate with age, um, also accumulate due to stress, uh, and then with time they also induce uh, bystander effects, namely they secrete um, uh, inflammatory cytokines that contribute to tissue degeneration and inflammation of tissues. Um, so that, that is the hypothesis, uh, and there's actually quite a lot of interest now in developing drugs that prevent or that eliminate uh, senescent cells. Uh, so for example, senolytic drugs, there's uh, quite a few companies and labs working on this, um, that selectively destroy senescent cells. Um, so we've also looked in cell senescence in the context of, um, so cell senescence is thought to be an anti-cancer mechanism. We looked at it in the, in the context of normal aging. Um, so what we observed was that, so again, without going into a lot of details, this was a paper we published earlier this year where we did various analyses. Um, but we can actually look into, uh, again, genes that go up and down during cell senescence and, um, and, and aging. And what we observed is that for genes that increase during um, cell senescence and are important for promoting cell senescence, you do see a um, overrepresentation of this gene with age in, um, in human tissues, at least in some human tissues. So in more human tissues, actually, they would be expected by chance. Um, but there are exceptions. And again, one of them is the uterus, where you actually see um, fewer genes associated with, uh, with cell senescence and genes associated that tend to decline with, um, uh, with age in the uterus that promote cell senescence. So the opposite of what you'd expect. Um, so the take home message is that uh, you do see signatures, gene expression signatures of cell senescence in, um, in normal human tissues with age, um, more than expected by chance, but there are exceptions. There are tissues where you don't see it, like the uterus would be an exception. So, so cell senescence, which some people argue is one of the driving mechanisms of aging, um, I would say it's probably not the driving mechanism of aging in every organ um, in the body. So, so switching gears a bit, um, I've talked uh, quite a bit about genes and their impact on aging. Um, but of course, the other aspect about health and aging is, is diet and lifestyle. I guess particularly now in the context of, of COVID-19, where um, we tend to spend, <laughs> stay home most of the time. Um, and we have, uh, I mean, I put on some weight during this, uh, this lockdown, so uh, I'm definitely not a good example. Um, so what is the impact of, of diet also on longevity and aging? I think it's a very important topic. Now, there's a number of studies and there's a number of different diets that impact on aging. Um, I'll focus on just one, which is arguably, not arguably, for sure, the most widely studied one, which is caloric restriction. So this was, I mean, early work in beginning of last century, actually, um, by Clive McKay and colleagues at Cornell. And well, there was actually earlier studies indicating this effect as well. So basically, if you keep animals, so this was initially observed in rats. If you keep animals in the lab, you fed them ad libitum. They can eat how much, when they want. Uh, but if you restrict the amount of calories they can eat while maintaining healthy levels of vitamins and minerals, um, they live longer. 
significantly longer. I mean, this is a, this actual story, I think, from Eddie Massaro in San Antonio. So they can live up to, in some strains of mice and rats, they can live up to 50% longer, which is quite remarkable. And again, it delays age-related diseases. So the animals still grow old, but they develop age-related diseases later in life. Um, so it's as if the process of aging is being retarded, um, a bit like you see in some genetic models. Um, and if I can summarize, you know, 50 years of research in caloric restriction, we know it extends lifespan in most species, so in traditional model systems, worms, mice, rats, flies, yeast, um, but not in all of them. There are species in which caloric restriction does not extend lifespan. Um, it does seem to have negative side effects, for example, um, Caloric restriction induces a lower body temperature, which can be detrimental in fighting infections. The mechanisms are largely unknown. Um, so probably they involve hormonal changes, probably at level of growth hormone signaling as well. Um, you know, just like when you impair growth hormone signaling in mice, it extends lifespan. It probably plays some role in caloric restriction as well. Um, there's a number of possible players. I mean, this is a, a figure from a, a paper we did some years ago. Um, there's likely some signaling mechanisms that are partly understood, but not fully understood. So um, we wanted to study caloric restriction. I mean, there's obviously been a lot of technological breakthroughs, uh, but at the level of DNA sequencing, I mean, this is a, a photo of me pretending to work with this machine. Um, I mean, what I do know is that there's been a lot of new techniques and approach that really make it possible now to sequence genomes in a much more cost-effective basis. So you can sequence your um, you can sequence your genome now for less than a thousand dollars, which is quite remarkable. So there's been this exponential drop or exponential increase in our capacity for sequencing DNA. Uh, and we've taken advantage of this for a number of projects. So so in the context of aging, I mean just this is something we published a few years back. We did uh, RNA seq, we sequenced the transcriptome of aging in mammals. Um, I think we were the first lab to do that. Uh, so, so it's a good example actually of, we found a number of uh, dark matter transcripts, that is transcripts that don't map to known exons. We even found new genes in uh, during aging, uh, changing with age in the, the brain of rats. Um, so again, I published this some years back. Um, in the context of caloric restriction, we also did RNA seq of caloric restriction. Um, again, in the brains of rats, uh, and what we found was found a number of neuroprotective genes that are overexpressed in caloric restriction. And I mean, uh, we did another um, uh, dietary manipulation with lipoic acid. So we found both of these activate a number of neuroprotective genes like thyroidoxin. Um, we found a number, what was most intriguing actually, was that it was a number of epigenetic regulators from caloric restriction. We found changes in, um, in chromatin-related genes, epigenetics. We validated one microRNA actually, MER98-3P, which is known to be involved in neuroprotection. And we did, uh, we did this experiment in brain cells where we, well, actually we used mimics and we inhibited, we silenced it, and we activated it. Um, and we think that it, it, it affects, again, it, it works via histone deacetylases. We hypothesize this um, to, uh, to have a neuroprotective effect in the brains of rats. Um, so we did these various analyses. And again, I think I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. We published this paper in genome biology some years back. But again, it's a good example of using um, sequencing technologies to gather insights on aging and its manipulation. Now, the other thing we've done is, okay, so we've had all of these signatures, all of these gene expression signatures of, of longevity, of caloric restriction. Uh, and as I'm sure you're aware, there are databases, public databases of signatures of drugs. So you can obtain gene expression signatures of drugs. So we thought, all right, so can we find drugs that induce a gene expression signature similar to that we see in life extension, specifically in dietary restriction. So we, we, we use caloric restriction gene expression signatures. Um, and I mean, it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. Um, and uh, the interesting thing was that when we, we tested over a thousand compounds uh, and several of them extended, um, came up as hits. We then went to worms uh, and we tested 
five compounds in worms. Four of them extended lifespan. Not that just the extended lifespan, they extended lifespan in a caloric restricted manner. I mean, we published this in, in Aging Cells some years back again, so I won't go into details. Basically, we what we observed was that these four drugs, they extend lifespan in, um, in normal worms, but when you put the worms in caloric restriction, they no longer extend lifespan. So they seem to act as caloric restriction mimetics. So that was quite interesting. I mean, one of the compounds was Alantoin, which was a new compound in not being... I mean, there are some formulations of Lantuin being used for skin aging, but not for organismal aging. So it is it is a, a compound that we're now studying in more detail and trying to understand the mechanism involved. So, but what I think is interesting is that this show that this approach, this natural pharmacology approach, can reveal new compounds associated with life extension uh, and longevity, and specifically caloric restriction. Now, the other aspect that we're also employing these data-driven approaches is, uh, is at the level of machine learning. Uh, so we've done a lot in terms of network approaches and including network pharmacology. Then the other aspect that I think is quite timely now is at the level of machine learning and AI. So, I mean, we did this review some years back with, with Alex Freitas, my, my long-time collaborator in computer sciences uh, on machine learning and aging that, I mean, I invite you to, to, to read if you're interested in this topic. But basically machine learning, I think that the, the best way to explain it is, you know these websites where, um, or sometimes pages on Facebook, they allow you to, um, to tell which is your Game of Thrones character, which is your better match. So those pages work basically by machine learning. So you go there and uh, you indicate some of your features. For example, do you like to kill people? Yes or no? And depending on the answers you give, that will match you, match your features to the features of the Game of Thrones characters. And then it will tell you, all right, you, you are Cersei or whatever you are um, in the Game of Thrones. So that's the principle behind it. And of course, we can apply the same machine learning techniques to a lot of different problems, to health and to aging. So I'll show you uh, just one example of what we've been doing. We've been applying these same techniques for machine learning to look at cognitive aging. Oops, sorry. So, um, so essentially try to predict new genes associated with cognitive aging and function. And the principle is the same as the Game of Thrones. The principle is we look at the features associated with genes already known to be associated with cognitive function and aging, and then we try to predict new genes. We try to look, okay, are there other genes that have the same properties, the same features. That's essentially how it works. Now, of course, there's a lot of statistics behind it. Um, I don't have time to, to go into detail. I mean, we have a preprint already. This is mostly work done by uh, Daniel Palmer, uh, and I, I completely stole the explanation of machine learning uh, based on Game of Thrones from him, by the way. Um, and we have a bio uh, archive preprint already and another manuscript in preparation. So then, so we apply all these methods. We apply the machine learning. We make predictions. Um, we then test it in collaboration with Ian Deary in Edinburgh. Um, we tested 10 genes um, in a human cohort, one of which seems to be a potential new hit um, for a genetic association. Um, so again, this is another type of approach. I, I, I see machine learning as complementary to bioinformatics and, and systems biology. Um, it's a complementary approach that we can also use to prioritize and identify candidates for studies. Now, in the last bit, uh, I want to focus on a different topic, which is at the level of applying these genomic methods to study uh, long-lived species. So again, I won't go into a lot of detail. Most of this has been published, but I just want to point out a couple of the species we've been focusing on. So the first one is the naked mole rat. Uh, I mean, these are quite interesting, first of all, because they're the longest lived rodent. They're, they're quite small. They're a little bit bigger than a mouse, smaller than a rat, relatively small animals, but they can live over 30 years, which means they're the, they're the longest lived rodent, which is quite remarkable when you think of rats and mice, they only live about three or four years in the best conditions. And they're very cancer resistant. Um, so, uh, so we're very interested in these animals, and of course, you, you, you can't argue with their dazzling good looks. Um, so we sequenced the genome of this animal. Uh, we did various analyses, and we also make it publicly available online. So, uh, I mean, if you're interested in cancer or aging uh, or particular genes of interest, uh, all of the information is available online. 
The other species that uh, we, we sequenced was the bowhead whale. Now the bowhead whale is the second heaviest animal on earth after the blue whale uh, and it's been estimated to live over 200 years. I mean this is, uh, I mean obviously whales don't throw birthday parties or have ID cards so it's all based on um, anecdotal evidence and indirect methods. So we can, um, so there are biochemical assays that have been used, uh, some of our collaborators are using uh, racemization ratios in the, in the eye lenses of these animals, uh, and that's where those estimates come in terms of them living over 200 years. There's also some anecdotal evidence, uh, harpoons dating to 19th century being found 100 years later in, in whales, for example. So, I mean, when you put the whole evidence together, I'm not sure they live over 200 years, uh, I think it is very clear they live longer than humans. And of course, they live longer than humans in, in the wild without doctors or medicine. So, so they must have natural tumor suppressor mechanisms in particular, and disease suppressor mechanisms, um, particularly level tumor suppressors, because if you think about these massive animals, well, if everything being the same, you know, one rogue cell that proliferates uncontrollably and becomes cancer, uh, they should have cancer. They should not live to 100 years. They should die of cancer before that, but they don't. So, so they have to have some sort of tumor suppressors that we lack, and that's what we wanted to discover. So we sequenced the genome of the bowhead whale. Again, I'm not going to go into to details on it. And then we found a number of promising mutations in genes known to be associated with cancer and aging. So one example is ERCC1, which I may remember I told you earlier, if you knock out ERCC1 in mice, you have these mice that look to be aging faster. Um, and so when you look at ERCC1, it seems to have mutations in particular residues in the bowhead whale that are well conserved in other organisms. Um, so there are promising mutations in these animals um, that may be associated with their cancer and disease resistance. Um, this is also another protein called PCNA, which is also associated with cancer. And we made a 3D model. You can predict that the residue changes in the bowhead whale, which you see in red, um, they are involved in the interaction between PCNA and FAN1, which is another gene slash protein associated with cancer. So we found a number of candidates. I mean, of course, this is computational. I mean, uh, you can't really, really go to Alaska and, and make a knockout bowhead whale. So, I mean, what I would like, what I'd like to have funding to do would be to, to take some of these genes or to, say, take some of these mutations and create a mouse with these mutations and see if these mouse with the mutations found in the bowhead whale, if it's long lived and cancer resistance. We've also make all of this available online. So we have this the bowhead whale genome resource like we have for the naked mole rat. We make all of the information online. There's only so much analysis we can do and I'm a uh, big advocate of open science. Um, so I invite you to use these resources and to, to employ this, um, what I think, complementary species um, in your research. I, I, I think that I mean, I see mice and rats as models of disease. They're models that develop disease faster. These are models that protect against disease. They're models of disease resistance, so which I see as complementary. And really, ultimately, the aim is to, to intervene in aging. That's what I would like to do, you know, either via what we discover in long-lived species, drug discovery, um, and even gene therapy, that's, that's ultimately what I like to do. Uh, and I think thanks to all of these advances, I think there are opportunities now. And one thing that I've been involved as well is in uh, trying to classify senescence, uh, more recently immunosenescence actually with the WHO. If we could classify senescence um, as a disease, then uh, this would facilitate regulatory approval of any therapeutics aimed at aging. And I mean, we published this, this in science last year. If you're interested in more details or feel free to get in touch. As I said, we're now focusing on immunosenescence. Um, uh, that's given the COVID-19, I think it thought that would be very timely. Um, and so we want to make it easier for the regulatory landscape to be um, more amenable for companies and labs to develop interventions targeting aging. Uh, and there is a lot of, I mean, biotech companies focusing on aging. I mean, we, we did, I did this review some, some years back that may be interesting, um, as I'm sure, well, some of you may be aware of, Google started this company called Calico. They put in Last time I checked, it was over two billion dollars on it to, uh, uh, well, in their words, solve death or develop interventions for aging. Uh, I mean, Unity Biotech are focusing on analytics and they're 
well, one of their funders is Jeff Bezos from Amazon, the wealthiest man in the world. So there's really a lot of excitement in the field. Um, and I mean, I, these are the companies, it's also my disclaimer note of companies I um, consult and advise for. I mean, one company I actually wanted to just point out is Centaura. This is a company uh, uh, I'm uh, leading the scientific uh, strategy now, um, which aims to develop uh, gene therapy approaches for aging. Um, so, and if you're interested also, they're currently recruiting. So if anyone's looking for a job in the biotech sector and anti-aging, uh, please visit their website. So in summary, I've told you that uh, aging has, despite its tremendous potential and defines tremendous impact on human society and medicine, it remains a mystery of biology. We, we, we don't know why we age. As I said, there are hypotheses like DNA damage. You know, when you look at TRCC1 and DNA, well, if you increase DNA damage in mice, it accelerates aging, at least in some cases. But we still don't know for sure why human beings age. What is the driving mechanism of aging? Having said that, there's been huge progress, uh, particularly at the genetic level. Uh, our database, GeneAge, has over 2,000 genes associated with aging. Um, so really, we know of lots of genes, lots of pathways that I didn't have time to go, go through today. There's lots of longevity genes, lots of longevity pathways, like growth hormone signaling pathway, that we know in model systems, in animal models, impact on aging, which is very remarkable, uh, and I think it's a huge conceptual um, breakthrough in the field. Um, on the other hand, we also need to understand, you know, how those genes interact. So I, I argue that biology is becoming a mathematical problem, not just in aging, but um, in various fields. Um, and we're generating massive amount of data um, that, that require proper data analysis. Uh, I told you of our studies of transcriptomes cancer and aging whose uh, changes um, occur in opposite directions <clears throat> excuse me with some exceptions like um, like the thymus and the uterus the uterus is a very strong exception uh, i've told of our various methods machine learning methods network pharmacology methods um, and again i skipped a lot of details but if you're interested in any of those please check our websites check uh, uh, the papers that i mentioned and feel free to drop me an email and lastly, I've told you of our studies of, of lonely species to find genes, not genes that cause aging, but genes that protect against aging and age-related diseases, which is complementary, and I, I would argue synergistic to, to the approaches that most um, biomedical research focuses on. Um, and so with that, I, I just want to, to thank, of course, I'm just a spokesperson for the lab. There's a lot of people involved. I mean, Kasse did the aging cancer transcriptome analysis I mentioned. This is Daniel who did the the, um, the machine learning approaches. Uh, Dominic did a lot of the work on uh, on C. elegans and well, some work that's not been published yet on the mechanisms of Alantuin, for example. Um, several people like uh, Daniel uh, also focused on our databases. Uh, so really, uh, this um, all the work we've been involved is only made possible thanks to to a, a brilliant group of uh, of students and, and postdocs and scientists, uh, and of course thank to the funders without whom this would not be possible. Uh, and as I said, you know, all of the reprints uh, and preprints are available on our lab website. Uh, and if you have any questions or wish to discuss in more detail or have any suggestions, feel free, free to, to drop me an email. Thank you very much for your uh, time and attention. Thanks very much, Pedro, for an absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. The questions have been coming in thick and fast, so I'll try to get through as many of them as I possibly can in the next sort of five to ten minutes. Um, interesting one. Uh, one question came in to say that if you have two sets of grandparents, one of whom lives for a long time and the other one dies young, is there evidence to suggest which trait the grandchildren might inherit in terms of longevity? That's a good question. The short answer is I don't know. The longer guess would be, uh, my understanding, my recollection is that if you have grandparents that live a long time, that increases your chances of also living a long time. Uh, because if you have grandparents that have a short lifespan, that could be completely unrelated to to aging. They could they could mm -hmm. die of accidents or uh, you know just a, a, some freak disease, uh, an infectious disease, something that uh, uh, is unrelated to aging. So 
I don't know for sure, but my understanding, and of course it depends on the, on the so it depends on the causes of that of the short-lived grandparents is my point. But my guess would be, without knowing any more information on that, my guess would be that if you have some grandparents that live long, that would be good for you, even if your other grandparents had a short lifespan. That someone else has said that there's obviously research indicating genetic variants and also epigenetic modifications that influence the rate of aging. Do you have a gut instinct feel for which of these two might have a greater impact on accelerated aging? So I guess in epigenetics, uh, um... You know, that's that's a very timely, exciting topic. I mean, we know I mean, one thing I, I didn't mention that I think is quite interesting in the field is the epigenetic clock, the fact that you have epigenetic marks, typically methylation changes that are very highly predictive of your chronological and biological age. Um, we don't know if those are causal, however. I think at the level of genetics, we do know, uh, at least for model systems, we do know those are causal. If you, if you disrupt growth hormone receptor in mice, you have long-lived mice. Um, I think that's very clear. At the epigenetics, we don't know causality yet. So I would say at the moment, it seems like the genetics is more important, but you know, I, I really think there's still a lot we need to discover and understand about epigenetics and aging. So kind of following on from that, there were a couple of questions as well around the cancer aging story. So mm -hmm. uh, someone pushing you a little bit to say that, um, you know, you've obviously seen dysfunction in cell cycle and the immune system. And mm -hmm. could the research demonstrating these um, changes with age be proxy for the fact that you're investigating cancer relative to aging? Um... I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think, I think what they were saying is that, you know, you're, you're seeing an association with mm. um, altered cell cycle and immune systems with aging and cancer, but say in neurodegenerative diseases, for example, maybe they don't see those cell cycle changes. So is it a little bit of a red herring, the data that are coming um, out? No, I, I think there's a that's a fair point. Yes, I, actually, there is another study by another lab, uh, um, Matthias Platzer in Germany. He's now retired, but used to be in Vienna, uh, where they look at neurodegenerative diseases, and basically they found that in uh, neurodegenerative diseases you see similar changes to aging um, in terms mm -hmm. of the gene expression. So what you see is you see changes in one direction in aging, the similar direction in neurodegenerative diseases, and in cancer you see the opposite direction, uh, which I, I think fits that that idea. Actually, what I think is more interesting to me is the variation between tissues. Um, the fact that you don't see the same patterns in all the tissues, you actually see some variation. You don't, you see tissues like the uterus, which is a mm -hmm. complete exception. Um, I mean, we're actually working with some colleagues here in Liverpool Women's Hospital to to explore. Uh, why that may be. So, um, so to me, that's that's actually the more interesting point is that there's tissue changes. Um, the other thing I would say that uh, I didn't mention, actually, a little going back to the epigenetics that we have. So, Cassett has uh, also a preprint now available. The, the manuscript is submitted currently um, on um, also this analysis of aging and, and cancer, but also includes epigenetic data uh, in mm -hmm. addition to transcriptome data and includes uh, mutational data, uh, and that's available on uh, our website. Okay, so sort of fascinating thoughts there and provoking thoughts. Um, another one which came through on that front was about the notion of cancer and aging creating a kind of a feedback system in those different mm. tissues. So if you have an aging tissue that's decreasing some genes, could cells in a neighboring tissue increase the expression of the genes and the proteins to compensate perhaps? Yes, no, no, that's 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 a brilliant question. Absolutely, uh, I think that's that's uh, very possible. I, I, I mean, and the other thing we haven't explored is there's different cell types as well. So, uh, mm. okay, so you see some changes. I mean, that's that's even before we look at the interaction with cancer, just in aging itself. Okay, we see changes in a particular tissue and gene expression, but how much of that is due to changes in a particular cell population as opposed to changes in so you can have changes in just one cell population instead of changes in all the cell types. And that's something that, that we don't know yet. Uh, as I'm mm -hmm. sure you're aware, there are now you know, single cell sequencing approaches, and that's something we're working on as well. Um, 
but uh, but we don't know. Uh, I, I think the the point I would say actually is that we have a, a project. Uh, one of my postdocs, uh, Cyril, is working on um, on single cell sequencing and also looking into cell interactions within tissue in the context of aging. Um, that hopefully will shed some light on that because that. But that's that's yes, yeah. that's a great point of something we need to to explore as well. The the cell interactions in aging and and also in cancer. Yeah. So, so a couple of questions then coming up. Uh, I mean, there's loads of questions and I'm afraid I'm not going to get through them all, um, but there were some questions that I'll try and link together. So um, somebody was asking about metabolism and aging, so perhaps being different between warm and cold-blooded animals, whether if you exercise, there might be a specific impact on age-related genes and a role for mTOR in the aging process so sorry three very okay. distinct questions rolled into one so okay so 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 yeah so there's a couple of questions there so absolutely there's different metabolism between cold and and warm-blooded species uh, i mean in, in, i mean in cold-blooded species you you know in worms you can put worms at 25 degrees or 20 degrees and they're going to live longer at 20 degrees because it's mm. you know it slows their metabolism um, in uh, in mice you cannot do that although well Bruno Conti in San Diego has some um, genetically engineered mice that have a lower body temperature and they also live longer so absolutely there are differences um, that that that's very that's very clear um, was well, the second part we were about exercise? So um, around, yeah, kind of changing mm -hmm. signaling in mTOR and aging, nutrition, aging, exercise, aging. If there are any kind so, of allied genes. Yeah. So I mean, so mTOR, of course, has been associated with aging in model systems. It's been strongly associated with cancer. Um, I think so. My take as well would be that so at the moment it seems that reduced mTOR signaling is associated with life extension. I mean that there's there's different models of it. I think in invertebrates that's clear. In mice there's a couple of different mouse models, including um, Colin Selman in Glasgow, for instance. Yeah. Um, the suggestion seems to be that reduced mTOR signaling is beneficial. Um, there's also, I mean, I, I can say there's also now, you know, uh, some emerging results also showing different effects of mTOR in different tissues as well in the context of aging. So I, I would say the way I see it, mTOR is a very blunt instrument. I mean, because it affects mm. lots of pathways, there's lots of things. So uh, so it's quite a blunt instrument. I think the, the challenge is also to uh, identify, you know, downstream signaling pathways um, and mm possibly even therapy, well, drugs, pharmacological approaches that are more specific to the longevity benefits of mTOR. Because on the other hand, I mean, it, it does other things that we don't want, like immunosuppression. So mm -hmm. um, so that's 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 the big challenge. I think mTOR, I mean, mTOR is a talk in itself. Yeah, I think, I think that's very true. Thank you ever so much, Pedro. In the interest of time, we've, we've just got a couple of minutes now until the end of the session, and there's a few things I need to do. Uh, to round up. So thank you again for a truly fantastic presentation and an excellent Q&A session and apologies I couldn't get all of the questions My addressed. Pleasure. However, conversation can continue online um, using either the at Biochem SOC at BSRA or at PPP Publishing um, on Twitter and we have got a transcript of all of the questions so we might fire those off to you Pedro if, if sure. that's okay. Of course, um, yes. So Oh, thank you. So, so just to follow on then, um, a little, a few updates about coming sessions and so on. So if you do work in aging research or nutrient signaling and cellular metabolism, there's an opportunity to join us at the BSRA and Biochemical Society co-hosted scientific meeting on the metabolism of aging, which is taking place in Birmingham in September 2021. So the meetings aimed at researchers in a range of disciplines, uh, including aging, biochemistry and uh, biology medicine. Um, and ultimately, the aim is to bring together people who are interested in working on the underlying biological processes of aging with those developing interventions to improve a healthy lifespan. So September 2021 for the metabolism of aging in Birmingham. Uh, also, there's a really fantastic opportunity coming up hosted by the Biochemical Society. Um, if you'd like to revisit their 2018 conference on the changing landscape of research on aging, you actually can do so. 
So the lectures were recorded um, from that one day symposium and they'll be made available on an on, uh, on demand download in November. Sorry, I got that a little bit confused there. So you can rewatch the 2018 lectures on demand in November. And if you visit biochemistry.org forward slash events and training, you'll be able to find out more about that opportunity. So I just also wanted to talk to you a little bit about the um, societies and they op the opportunities which they provide. So we're obviously living in very challenging times and in these times it's more important than ever really to stay connected. So being part of a learned society does actually provide you with that opportunity. It promotes an academic discipline or groups of related disciplines and provides you with a chance through expanded online activities during COVID-19, for example, uh, to keep in touch. So the Biochemical Society and the BSRA are both non-profit organizations which host conferences. They have associated journals for wider dissemination and they provide opportunities for grant applications and collaborations. So if you haven't already done so, this is an opportunity to join one or both of those societies and their communities of researchers and specialists to stay connected, but also to take advantage of benefits which include reduced registration fees for conferences, access to grants, online access to journals, to mention just one or two of the perks involved. Um, and you could visit either of those two websites for more information. So just in rounding up now, um, we really do welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature on the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. This is an opportunity for you to engage and get involved. If you have an idea for a webinar, we invite you to submit a proposal on our website. Absolutely support that. And that's a fantastic opportunity to prevent, uh, to, sorry, progress knowledge and collaboration. And to finish up, I'd just like to invite you to join us next week on the 24th of September for a webinar entitled The Biopharma Drug Development Pathway, Origins and Comparison with Small Molecule Discovery. This is, prevent, uh, this is presented by Professor Alexander Brees from the University of Leeds. Uh, you can register for this. You can also watch past webinar recordings and you can propose your own topics and find out more about the series by visiting Biochemistry. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>